We will not tolerate terrorism cross border terrorism. <laughs> It's an absolute honor and privilege for me to moderate this final session with, with three combat veterans and outstanding military professionals. One each from the Indian Army, the Indian Navy, and the Indian Air Force. It's an absolute honor to be in conversation with these three illustrious military professionals. Thank you, sir. Since the partition of British India in 1947, India and Pakistan have remained in contention over several issues. However, the Kashmir conflict has been the predominant one, along with other border disputes, notably over the run of Kutch. Taking advantage of India's defeat in 1962 in the Sino-Indian War, Pakistan saw this as an opportunity to win a battle they had lost earlier in 1947-48, to which was the First Kashmir War. Pakistani soldiers began patrolling in territories controlled by India in January 1965. The armed struggle between the two countries from August to September 1965 began following Pakistan's Operation Gibraltar, which was designed to infiltrate forces into Jammu and Kashmir to precipitate an insurgency against Indian rule. This became the immediate cause of the Second India-Pakistan War. Operation Gibraltar was followed by Operation Grand Slam on the Pakistani side and Operation Riddle on the Indian side. However, a quick and firm response by India took Pakistan by surprise and thwarted their well-laid-out plans. India recaptured Kargil Heights and Haji Pir Pass. All this and the loss of key positions in the Kishanganga bulge were a severe setback for the Pakistanis. And by the end of August 1965, Pakistan's plans were squarely defeated. Jai Hind. Imagine a child in the middle of a battlefield, forced into years of subjugation, and then, just when she had breathed in the air of freedom, is pushed into a war where the enemies are her own family, wanting to kill her, violate her, destroy her. Does this prospect make you afraid? Now imagine a country of 34 crore people suffering through the same ordeal. The same tragedy. On 22nd of October 1947, the Pakistani militia, also known as the Lashkars, consisting of the Pashtun and Tanoli tribesmen, crossed the border of the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir and entered into Muzaffarabad district, killing, beheading, looting all the Hindus and Sikhs living in the Baramulla. All this was done in a bid to preempt Jammu and Kashmir from joining India. However, at that time, the ruler of Jammu and Kashmir, Maharaja Hari Singh, was facing a major uprising by his Muslim subjects, gradually losing the key western districts of his kingdom. He pleaded to India for help, which was provided to him in lieu of the term that he had to sign an instrument of accession to India. After the instrument was signed, the Indian forces came into action and the operation in Kashmir Valley was initiated. Present-day Indian military consists of about 1.4 million active personnel and houses some of the great special forces like the Gadur Commandos, Marcos, Sahastra Simabal, Para Special Forces and others who, along with the modern and upgraded weaponry, armors, military transports, are a juggernaut force and whose only warning to its enemies is Hum ghar mein ghus ke marenge. To the Indian Army, we were because you were, we are because you are. To understand such historical subjects in more detail, it is imperative to understand the context of the events that unfolded, that is, the circumstances leading to the events that we presently discuss upon. Major William Alexander Brown was a young officer of the British Indian Army and the commanding officer of the Gilgit Scouts, who were responsible for policing and protection of the northern territories of Gilgit and Baltistan, set up by the British Raj on 1913 on behalf of the Maharaja of the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir. 
On the 3rd of June, 1947, the control of the Gilgit Agency was transferred to the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir by the British Raj. The state's Maharaja, Maharaja Hari Singh, appointed Brigadier Ghansar Singh of the Jammu and Kashmir State Forces to govern the area on his behalf. The partition of India took place in August of that year, which divided the former British Raj into Hindu-majority India and a Muslim-majority Pakistan. Proceeding forward with the events on October 22, 1947, amidst Pakistani fears of the Maharaja potentially acceding his Muslim-majority princely state to India, the state-backed Pashtun tribal militias from Pakistan invaded the Jammu and Kashmir princely state and attacked the Maharaja state forces. As Pakistani militias closed in on the capital of Srinagar by the 26th of October, Hari Singh had fled from the princely state and signed an instrument of accession for Jammu and Kashmir with India. Allowing Indian troops to be deployed into the previously princely state, thus beginning the first Indo-Pakistan war of 1947. Brown's view on the escalating Kashmir conflict was that the whole of the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, including the Gilgit areas, should go to Pakistan in view of the fact that the state's population was predominantly Muslim and the foundation of Pakistan's existence was on the accommodation of Muslim-majority regions in British India. Brigadier Singh ignored the subsequent warnings and did not size up the situation well, which prompted Major Brown to begin planning what became known as Operation Datta Khel. Major Brown, being well aware of the anti-Maharaja sentiments among the populace of the Gilgit Agency, went ahead to surround the Gilgit re Residency, the residence of the governor in the city of Skardu, and arrested the governor, Brigadier Ghansar Singh, his close aide, Chib Singh, and their respective families, who were later taken into protective custody. The accession of a princely state of Jammu and Kashmir to India was a decision made by our Maharaja Hari Singh Ji, the ruler of our state. The accession was met with opposition from Pakistan, which claimed Jammu and Kashmir as a part of its territory. Maharaja wanted the state to remain independent and offered a standstill agreement to both India and Pakistan. Pakistan agreed, but India asked for further discussions. Pakistan then betrayed Jammu and Kashmir by sending its forces to attack. At the time when Pakistani raiders were about to reach the airfield and the capital city, after having sacked, pillaged, burned, looted and raped in Muzaffarabad, Uri and Baramula, Maharaja Hari Singh Ji abandoned his efforts to somehow become independent and signed an instrument of accession to India and the army, the Indian army was offered order to save Srinagar and evict the invaders. India had very few troops in Kashmir then. The Maharaja state army had collapsed. Its British chief left the next day, in line killed by raiders close to Baramula, Muslim troops defected and thousands of others just hid in fright. India and Pakistan both had British army chiefs then, as well as a large sprinkling of British officers. As war became inevitable between the two nations, just 11 weeks old. Shama shil ho ripu samaksh, tum huye vinit jitna hi. Shama shil ho ripu samaksh. तुम हुए विनीत जितना ही दुष्ट कौरवों ने तुमको कायर समझा उतना ही सच पूछो तो शर्मे ही बसती है दीप्ति विनय की सच पूछो तो शर्मे ही बसती है दीप्ति विनय की संधि वचन संपूज्य उसी का जिसमें शक्ति विजय की जिसमें शक्ति विजय की धन्यवाद जय हिंद वंदे मातरम भारत माता की जय when India gained independence on 15th August 1947, there were all 562 princely states ruled by the respective monarchs. The Britishers who ruled India for nearly a hundred years gave the princely states the option to either join India or stay independent. Most of the states chose to merge with India and as India was becoming bigger and more powerful, a big princely state called as the state of Hyderabad emerged right in the middle of India and it chose to be independent. State of Hyderabad was ruled by Muslim ruler Mir Usman Ali Khan, he was called the Nizam. At that time, Mir Usman Ali Khan was the richest man in the world. By some estimates, he had a worth equal to 2% of current US GDP. His major source of wealth was the Golconda Mines, the only supplier of diamonds in the world at that time. Among them was Jacob Diamond, which valued at 61 million US dollar, was used as a paperweight by the Nizam. 
He was given the title of faithful ally of British Crown for his funding to the Crown during World War I. Nizam did not sign the instrument of accession. State of Hyderabad had a population which was 85% Hindus. On 29 November 1947, Nizam signed an agreement called the Standstill Agreement with India. According to this agreement, the state of Hyderabad would remain independent and continue to control defense, external affairs and communication of the state. The most important condition of this agreement is that Hyderabad will not merge with Pakistan. Because of this agreement, India had to pull out all its troop position in the state. It looked like the Nizam had won. But soon after the agreement was signed, Nizam began to violate the terms and conditions of the standstill agreement. It began approaching Pakistan to help him build an army to protect Hyderabad from India. He also raised a large all-Muslim paramilitary force called the Razakas. They were led by a fanatic leader, Qasim Razvi, an advocate by profession. On 31 August 1948, India gave an ultimatum to the Nizam to disband the Razakas and allow Indian troops to be stationed inside Hyderabad to maintain peace. This was directly rejected by the Nizam. War was now inevitable. The Indian Army launched Operation Polo. The State Army of Hyderabad was led by Major General L. Edrus. His army consisted of three armored regiments, one horse cavalry regiment, 11 infantry battalions and artillery, artillery 6,000 regular men and 18,000 irregular. In addition to these, there were 2,000 Razakas also. To attack Hyderabad, Indian Army adopted the Godet plan. This plan envisaged two main thrusts, one from Vijayawada from east, which, which will be commanded by Major General A. A. Rudra, and other from Solapur in the west, which will be commanded by Major General J. N. Chaudhary. The overall command of the operation was under Lieutenant General Rajendra Singh Ji. Around 35,000 soldiers of the Indian Army would take part in Operation Polo. भारत एक अखंड राष्ट्र है सवा अरब की ताकत है हमसे कोई आंख मिला ले भला किसकी हिमाकत है धरती अंबर और समंदर को ये भाषा समझा दो दुनिया के हर पंच सिकंदर को ये भाषा समझा दो कि अब खंडित भारत माता की तस्वीर नहीं होने वाली मेरे देश की धरती का एक इंच टुकड़ा भी किसी के बाप की जागीर नहीं होने वाली किसी के बाप की जागीर नहीं होने वाली सम स्पोकन वर्ड्स बिकम इमोर्टल लाइक नो सर I will not abandon my tank. My gun, gun is still working, and I will get these people. Second Lieutenant Arun Khedrapal's radio message to his squadron second in command when told to abandon his tank after it was hit by the enemy tank. War heroes serve as a powerful reminder that bravery and sacrifice are not just abstract concepts, but tangible actions that can shape the course of history. Arun Khedrapal, a former National Defense Academy graduate, joined the Indian Military Academy in 1971. He was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the 17th Pune Horse Unit. As war broke out with Pakistan on the 3rd of December 1971, the 17th Pune Horse was assigned the command of the 47th Infantry Brigade and was soon called into the bloodbath of Shakalghar sector in the Battle of Basanta. On 16 December 1971, Pakistani armor launched a counterattack at Jarpal, targeting the B Squadron. Second Lieutenant Arun Khetrapal in A Squadron responded and successfully subdued the enemy advance with his tanks. Despite heavy casualties, Khetrapal continued his attack, attacking incoming Pakistani troops and tanks. Pakistani forces regrouped and counterattacked, resulted in a tank battle where Khetrapal fought off and destroyed 10 enemy tanks. Despite being hit by enemy fire, Khetrapal remained determined to fight on, destroying the remaining tanks and ultimately preventing the Pakistani army from gaining the intended breakthrough. However, during this heroic endeavor, 2nd Lieutenant Khetrapal received martyrdom. His body and tank, Farmer Gusta, were captured and returned to the Indian Army. Joy Bangla is a very common slogan pertaining to the 1971 Bangladesh Liberation War. This slogan literally means victory to Bengal, a slogan which was about to become reality. The Bangladesh Liberation War fought in 1971 was one of the great wars in India's military history. Its ramifications incorporate the development of the new country of Bangladesh and the third Indo-Pak war. In this report, I will aim to uncover the crux of this war, its causes and its consequences. The Bangladesh Liberation War of 1971 was a result of the ongoing political disputes between East Pakistan and West Pakistan. When small drops collect in large numbers, ladies and gentlemen, they can cause massive floods. And this fact was exemplified by Mujibur Rahman's victory in Bangladesh's general elections in 1970. A victory which instilled a sense of fear and dissatisfaction amongst the officials of the West Wing. Thus, 
the agartala conspiracy case of 1968 was created and mujibur rahman was detained in agartala on suspicion of conspiring against the pakistani government with india by pakistani general ayub khan however rahman's popularity in east pakistan was underestimated by the general and east pakistan was rocked with with protests calling for his unconditional release eventually general ayub khan gave in to the uprisings in east pakistan and liberated rahman on june 22 1969 freedom our birthright this conflict which unfolded in 1971 remains a powerful testament to the indomitable spirit of people yearning for freedom and the struggle for justice let's begin with the background of this war despite being the majority in population the people of what was then east pakistan now bangladesh were experiencing severe political and economical disparities and faced exploitation and neglect from west pakistan the demand for autonomy and fair representation grew stronger leading to widespread unrest and discontent the situation reached the boiling point on march 26 1971 when the pakistani military launched a brutal crackdown on the people of east pakistan this marked the beginning of the bangladesh war of liberation thank you very much uh, delegates for your very very deeply researched and insightful commentaries on uh, the 1947 48 conflict the 65 war the 71 war and the liberation of hyderabad but my question to you sir is that soon after you were commissioned uh, it was a time of high tension with china uh, if i also recollect your battalion was part of the first indian army brigade to be inducted in the northeast frontier agency which is now arunachal can you can you tell the audience uh, how was it as a young officer to be inducted in an area that had little roads no infrastructure inclement weather and how long did it take for the unit to move from its peace time location to its operational location in nepa i was commissioned in june 1958 and my first posting was to ambala and i had all these various perceptions of what a great army we were and how we would train and how we would take india to greater glory etc but when i reached ambala i was my battalion was part of four infantry division and what were we doing we were supposed to be training for war but we were building houses the most versatile and famous division of world war 2 for indian infantry division was building houses and the person in charge was an officer who had never commanded a company never commanded a battalion never commanded a brigade promoted to major general through his political contacts contacts the reason i'm saying this to you is that we should be aware as citizens of india that the armed forces should be left alone to do what they're supposed to do without political interference because that is only going to cause disaster after building houses for a year when the situation got very bad and china was attacking india both in aksai chin and in nifa we have suffered a lot of casualties but the indian prime minister refused to accept the warning by sardar patel that china is not a friend it is an enemy but he didn't listen finally in 1959 november when political when people were protesting finally four infantry division was moved for the defense of nifa a division which had not trained for 4 years at that time china was able to reach the borders because tibet was a plateau whereas we were taken to nifa it took 6 days for the train to reach masamari from there onwards it took 6 months for us to reach our operational locations because we had to be transported by air to very difficult air fields at walong and dapurijo and tawang etc so dapurijo was 18 days march from the border the border had posts at longju at limiking 
at Maja, 18 days march across jungle paths, which had every possible type of animal and every type of insect since the creation of the world. It was, it was populated by fierce warlike tribes who fought with swords, daggers, and spears. It was as if, as if my battalion was transported into the Iron Age. Finally, we, we, we got to know of the area by serving in those areas for three and a half years. But our intelligence was so poor that by July 1962, two months before China attacked, our battalion was de-inducted to a peace location. So the second point, we need to put up to make sure that our intelligence functions properly. Finally, you know what happened. It has been brought home to you that we, we suffered a defeat. But let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, we can learn more from defeat than from victory. We had lots of lessons to learn, and those lessons were very valuable for us in 1965 and 1971 wars. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for that very, very insightful uh, uh, rendition of your uh, of your initial experiences. Military history is not about hagiography, but military history also offers you a mirror to look at yourself. And when you study the India-China War of 1962 and the kind of experiences that General Cardozo experienced as a second lieutenant, it offers a mirror into what military preparedness ought to be and what infrastructure is important to tackle a formidable adversary like the Chinese. Now, so before I move to uh, Air Marshal Rajkumar, uh, I must request you, sir, quickly to mention to this audience the, the significance of the Kukri, the <laughs> Kukri that is so dear to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, this uh, assumes more significance in the 1971 war, which I shall come to later, but keep this at the back of your mind. The Gurkha Kukri when, is the extension of the arm of the Gurkha soldier. What the Gurkha can do with the Kukri is pure magic. <laughs> in the night, as a pollute to what I'm going to say later on, in the 1971 war, in the Battle of Atgram, we launched a midnight attack, a surprise attack on Atgram, and Kukris flashed at night in the moonlight, and 32 head Pakistani had rolled. After that, those who escaped told their colleagues, don't mess with the Gurkhas because you're liable to lose your head. And later on, they refused to come in close combat with us in the Battle of Ghazipur and Silet. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Air Marshal uh, Rajkumar, sir, you, you too were commissioned uh, in the backdrop of the 1962 war, which is November 1962. And one of the most significant historical misses of the 1962 war is that we did not use the offensive element of the Indian Air Force in the 1962 India-China conflict. Though the helicopter fleet and the transport fleet were used extensively, but I think uh, uh, you as a young officer in your first squadron must have been extremely frustrated to talk about what if. So can you share with this audience your first few experiences in the squadron and, and what was the atmosphere like about not participating in the 1962 war? I was a cadet at the jet training wing in Hakimpet, Hyderabad, uh, when the Chinese conflict started on the 20th of October 1962. It so happened that on the 18th of October I had done my midterm flying test and after the Chinese attack took place, there was a great sense of urgency in all that the government of India did. And instead of gradually commissioning on the 20th of September, we were commissioned on the 10th of November without completing the final flying test. As cadets, we were delighted to get commissioned. But at the same time, there was a great mood of despondency in the country. And by February, end of February 1963, I ended up in a Tufani squadron at Kalaikunda, number 47. And at Kalaikunda at that time, we had two Tufani squadrons, two hunter squadrons, 
and in the east we had one tufani squadron at tezpur and a vampire squadron at jorhat so what rankled our minds at that time was why wasn't air power used in the chinese conflict and the persistent answer we got was that there was a fear that indian cities would be bombed especially kolkata and delhi and the political leadership perhaps was not willing to face the consequences of the indian public being subjected to aerial bombing that apart there was also a school of thought within our own air quarters that the use of fighters in densely jungled terrain would not be possible it not would not yield proper results this was based on the experience of the indian air force fighting in burma in world war 2 where the fighters were largely used for something called tactical reconnaissance and it is very difficult to see troops and equipment being moved when the terrain has got thick jungles all around and the japanese were past masters in using the cover of the jungle but what we forgot was that the chinese were coming down mountain passes narrow mountain passes like sela and bomdila and we could have easily blocked those passes by accurate bombing attacks which we were very capable of doing but we did not use it and the indian army as general cardozo mentioned suffered a severe defeat so the mood in the squadron was we were very keen to become fully operational so that we could get into any future action at the same time we kept wondering why the air force was not used now in the on the 1st of august 1963 i was still an under training tufani pilot when overnight we were moved to bagdogra and the second tufani squadron was moved to hasimara because there were intelligence reports that there was a troop build up in the chumbi valley now the chumbi valley is the little sliver of land which separates sikkim from bhutan and bagdogra and hasimara were the closest air fields there now this intelligence report to be proved to be entirely erroneous it was a false alarm but there i was all of 22 years old at that time under training to fani pilot expected to go and fight the chinese but we were all not scared we were just waiting for the action to commence so that was generally the mood in the squadron we were young perhaps foolish but we were all waiting for action young young foolish and waiting for action so typical of 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 a large bunch of us who uh, who are who are raring for action uh, now just staying for a moment with air power in 1962 uh, i must also share with you reflections from two other officers who were actually raring to go uh, a former air chief air chief marshal tipness whom all of you have heard of was a young officer in a pathan coat hunter squadron and he tells me during my research that they were flying regularly along the shok river in ladakh and ready for action similarly air marshal patni who commanded uh, western air command during the kargil conflict was a young flight lieutenant in a tufani squadron in tezpur and he says that we were training the entire summer of 1962 with the indian army in arun in nefa and we were surprised how we didn't go into go into action in october so that's as far as 1962 is concerned like offensive air power not being used in 1962 Uh, one of the mysteries of the 1965 war was our hesitation to use the indian navy admiral arun prakash sir you were commissioned in 1966 but you were up and about in 1965 on board the ins vikrant as a midshipman uh, what was the state of the ship was it battle worthy had you started flying off the deck and what were the conversation and the mood in the wardroom exactly as i asked Uh, air marshal rajkumar about the crew room uh, let me start by complimenting mr darshan singh for conceiving this event and mr kunal verma for executing it so brilliantly uh, i hope that the seed that has been sown over the past 7 years 
will soon germinate into something tangible when these young people grow up and occupy positions of decision making and so on. Now, the purpose of studying history is, I think, to my mind, is mainly to learn lessons and ensure that we don't make the mistakes that we had made in the past in the future. Unfortunately, in real life, this is not true. And the two um, narratives that you just heard are proof of that. Uh, 1962, we had a formidable air force. We had some of the most modern aircraft anywhere in the world. And yet, the government of India hesitated to use air power for various reasons. And I mainly in comprehension about national security, in comprehension about use of force. And the same story was repeated in 1965 as far as the Indian Navy was concerned. I was a young midshipman on INS Vikrant. The carrier was fully battle-worthy. Uh, the squadrons were embarked. They could have undertaken any operations. In fact, early part of that year, we went to Kuwait on a goodwill mission. On our way back, the Kutch operation, as you all know, the 1965 was, these young people have just told us, the 1965 episode was in two parts. The first part in Kutch, where the Pakistanis were testing our determination, our battle-worthiness, and they also wanted to draw the Indian forces southwards for what they intended to do later. So they wanted to try out their new American equipment. They wanted to see the resolve of the Indian uh, state, uh, and they were ba basically testing. So Vikrant passed by Kutch on its way to Mumbai. We carried out an, uh, an exercise with the army. So the ship was fully available. But then there was a ceasefire in Kutch at the end of April and the Navy was told, not told anything. So the ship went into a refit, a major maintenance period. The rest of the Indian fleet, reasonably capable, certainly superior to whatever the Pakistanis could put out at that time, was also sent to the east coast to exercise with a British submarine which we had asked for on loan to, to build up our expertise in anti-submarine warfare. So this was the state of affairs of the Indian Navy in mid 1965 because the government gave no indication to the naval headquarters. When this Kashmir affair started, which we've heard from our young students, um, first the Gibraltar, first the, after the Kutch operation stopped, then they went to Kashmir and started Operation Gibraltar. At that point of time, somebody in the government of India, possibly at the highest echelons, decided that the intention of India was not to expand the scope of war and it should be limited to the land and perhaps wherever inescapable to the air power. So the Indian Navy was given an order, whether it was in writing or verbal, one is not too sure now, that the Navy is not to operate north of the latitude of Por Bandar, uh, which is somewhere in Kutch, and it is not to seek engagement with the enemy unless it is attacked first. So in view of these instructions for what was inexplicable to us, uh, the Indian Navy did go out. The fleet came back from the East Coast. Vikrant was out of action because she was put into refit. And to whatever extent the Navy could do, they went out on two sweeps. And I, I was transferred from Vikrant to an anti-submarine frigate. We carried out anti-submarine operations, etc. But we could not seek uh, action. with the. We could not engage the enemy. And consequently, to answer your last question, there was tremendous frustration amongst officers, sailors, especially uh, the, the younger echelons, uh, tremendous criticism which was voiced and fortunately that criticism and introspection had a positive effect on what was to follow six years later in 1971. So one of the less discussed aspects of the 1965 war is Operation Gibraltar and that's the period of August 1965 when Operation Gibraltar involved uh, launching of Razakars, Mujahids, and regular troops uh, across multiple axes into Jammu and Kashmir uh, with the aim of severing Jammu and Kashmir by sparking and inciting an internal rebellion amongst the people of Jammu and Kashmir, which never happened. You were now in a new Gorkha battalion, right, sir? You were now in the 4th battalion of the 5th, 5th Gorkha Rifles, and you were defending a critical area on the ceasefire line as it was known at that time, and what everyone now knows as the line of control. And if I'm right, sir, between Punch and Rajori. Uh, in a few minutes, uh, could, you, could you expand to the audience as that how had you matured uh, as a soldier and as a leader from 1962 to 1965? And 
what did your battalion roughly do, do during these operations? Uh, before I comment on the present question, I'd like to make a small comment on what has already been said by the discussants. And that points to political and military leadership. I'll just give you a quote. An army of sheep led by a lion will do much better than an army of lions led by a sheep. Which means unless we get the right directions, nothing is going to happen. With regard to your question, sir, my battalion was raised on the 1st of January 1963. But the situation on the border was such that we did not have enough troops. So within six months, although we didn't have machine guns, we didn't have mortars, within six months we were holding the line of control, the ceasefire line. And then after about a year, no, after two years, we asked for permission to do collective training and we came down. We established camp on the 5th of August and while we were establishing camp, the gorillas struck. To their disadvantage, they struck one of the outposts of my battalion. Many of them were killed, some were captured. So we were the first battalion to get into contact with these gorillas, capture them and send them to the David quarters where they were debriefed and we came to Gibraltar. There were eight groups of, of these troops who operated across the ceasefire line in eight columns. One of them hit the area of Punch Rajauri where we were. To sum it up, within a month, we had captured the Indian army in those areas. <coughs> had captured over 1,253 gorillas. Within two months, Operation Gibraltar was scrapped. It was destroyed. And those who were not captured or killed went back to where they came from, that is Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. While commending ourselves on this operation, I would like to also give you a caveat. When we talk about looking into the minds of the enemy, we need to appreciate that Pakistan was able to send 12,000 guerrillas across the line of control and they operated behind the line, of, behind the ceasefire line for two months. That is not a small achievement. Pakistan would have carried out an in-search investigation, appreciation of what mistakes they made and make no mistake about it. In the next war, there will be collusion between Pakistan and China and they will use the same system once again. We should be ready for that. While we stick on with the 1965 war and Operation Gibraltar, uh, I would like to actually place on record uh, uh, the contribution of Lieutenant General Harbaksh Singh, the, the army commander or Western army commander, who can actually claim to be the architect of putting down Operation Gibraltar. He was one of uh, the Indian Army's most accomplished operational commanders ever. Along with, uh, uh, in my research as a military historian, I think the two Indian Army commanders, the, the, the two greatest Indian Army commanders of all time, field commanders, would be General Sagat Singh and General Harbak Singh, followed very closely by General Thimaya. Now, so what General Harbak, he had this ability to push units to the limits of their endurance. He had the ability to reach out to Air Force commanders and say, hey, look, you have Mi 8s, give me the Mi 8s, convert them into gunships, and, and I will hit the enemy from, from behind. And that's exactly what he did. So I think uh, we need to uh, acknowledge, continuously acknowledge uh, the contribution of General Harbaks. Air Marshal Rajkumar, sir. Uh, as an Air Force, uh, we, were, we were caught by surprise on 1st September 1965. And the Indian Air Force suffered heavy casualties or heavy uh, attrition in terms of loss of aircraft on the first day. To, uh, uh, to, to, to Pakistan Air Force strikes. But the Indian Air Force responded brilliantly and you were part of that initial response as part of number one squadron uh, in Adampur flying mistairs. So 
You flew several combat missions during the war, including deep strikes over airfields such as Sargoda. Uh, what was it like and how did the Indian Air Force grow in confidence as the war progressed? Uh, the audience would love to know what emotions run through the minds of a young flying officer when he faces anti-aircraft fire and ground fire on an inter or an interception by an aircraft like, a, like an enemy sabre. The air war started on the 1st of September 1965 when we lost four vampires on the first day and three pilots. So that shook everybody. We were in Adampur, further south of Patankot, and we were all itching to join the fray which was going on between the Nats and the Misters from Patankot versus the Sabres and 104s of the Pakistan Air Force. But for six days we waited and in that time we did a little bit of night flying. I did two sorties at night on the Mister, And then we were declared fully ops. Myself and a chap called flying officer Dange were declared fully ops. And we were ready to go into action. But the Pakistani army's pressure on the Indian army was unrelenting. And therefore on the 6th of September, Prime Minister Shastri authorized the Indian Army to, across, to attack across the international border in two sectors, the Sialkot sector and the Lahore sector. And on the early morning of 6th September, the Indian Army walked across the international border. Now, we were expecting to be called into action on the 6th to go and attack Pakistani aircraft over their airfields. Well, they were still parked on the ground. But no such order came. And we were wondering why. Our squadron commander, Wing Commander Taneja, led a four aircraft formation on an armed sweep in the Gujramwala sector. They shot up a goods train and came back. But there was no call to support the Indian Army advance or to attack Pakistani airfields. This was extremely puzzling for us sitting in the crew room. And at about one o'clock, we went to the mess to have our lunch, and then we heard President, Pakistan, uh, President of Pakistan, Field Marshal Ayub Khan, make a radio broadcast on Radio Pakistan. He said, the Indian Air Force has recklessly used its Air Force into action and widened the conflict, and Pakistan will have to respond. So we said, at least now we'll get the order to do something, but we waited and waited. And in the evening, the Pakistani Air Force struck Patankot, where we lost 10 aircraft on the ground. Then they attacked Adampur. Fortunately, the Sabre attack never took place, but a B-57 bomber came and destroyed a MiG-21, which was parked on the operational readiness platform. And then a Sabre attack over Halwara took place, where two of the attacking Sabres were shot down. Now we were still wondering what was going to happen next. We were told to go back to the mess, have an early dinner and sleep. And we were woken up at 3 a.m. by a messenger from the squadron to ask to report to the squadron at 4 a.m. So when we reported to the squadron at 4 a.m., the blackboard, the briefing board was made. Those days we had blackboards in which names were written in chalk. And there was a 12 aircraft mission planned to attack Sargoda in three formations of four aircraft. And I ran through the names on the board and I found that I was number 12 in the formation, the last man in the formation. Anyway, the briefing started. We went to the aircraft as we were supposed to attack Sargoda at dawn, that is at 6 a.m. Take off at 5.30 in darkness, go to Sargoda and attack Sargoda as dawn was breaking on Sargoda at 6 o'clock. So while walking to the aircraft, I was, my mouth was dry, I still remember. And a passing satellite was seen by our anti-aircraft gunners and they opened fire. So we all dived into the trench. And suddenly I heard my commanding officer's aircraft start up. So I ran to my aircraft, jumped in and pressed the starting button, and while the engine was revving up, I quickly strapped up and caught up with the formation taking on, um, taxiing out. The taxi lights were switched off. The runway lights hadn't been switched on. So we taxied out in total darkness. 
and the takeoff started. What had happened was that the previous night the attacking B-57 had dropped a bomb on the side of the runway and a lot of earth had been thrown onto the runway and as the aircraft started rolling there was a huge cloud of dust in the middle of the runway. Now the first four rolled, the second four rolled, then my leader, squad leader Handa and his number two fl flight left in Brar, they rolled and I was waiting for my leader, Kahai, Flight Lieutenant Kahai, to start his roll when one of the two standby aircraft which were parked on the side of the runway suddenly moved in front and took off. We didn't know who it was. And as I raised my nose wheel to take off, I went into this cloud of dust. And as I came out of the cloud, a couple of seconds later, I saw this huge mystery aircraft filling my windscreen. That was the standby aircraft which had taken off and drifted into my lane. And I was about to collide with him. So the mystery aircraft had a characteristic where if you did a slightly premature unstick from the ground, it yawed to the right. So I did exactly that. The aircraft yawed to the right. I quickly raised the undercarriage and flaps and staggered into the air, but I had lost sight of my leader, Kahai. So I burnt up fuel and came back and landed. About 20 minutes after I landed, the formation returned from Sargoda. All the aircraft had gone. And during the debrief, we discovered that out of the 13 aircraft which had got airborne, only six plus one, seven, seven aircraft had attacked Sargoda. What had happened was that in the first formation, two aircraft had turned back because of unserviceability. So the Wing Commander Taneja's two aircraft went. Then the standby uh, next formation of four led by squad leader Satur put in a successful attack. And the standby aircraft, which later we learned was squad leader Devaya, he had also reached target. But Devaya did not return. Only six aircraft came back. In, during the debrief, my squadron commander, wing commander, Om Prakash Taneja, he got very angry with my leader of my formation, squadron leader, Handa. And he said, Handu, you refuel, load up and go back. Now, this was broad daylight. There was no cover of darkness. And... Uh, we were asked to attack Sargoda at 10.15 in the morning. Now, the rationale for Wing Commander Taneja's order was very simple. He said, they will not be expecting you. You will have surprise on your side. You go. Now, when we got the order, I was now, again, number four in the formation. I was sick with fear. Please mark my words. I was sick with fear. You get something called butterflies in the stomach when you're so scared. So, we had a quick breakfast, briefed, and once we got into the aircraft, we'll be very surprised. I completely lost all sense of fear because one was so busy doing things in the cockpit that there was absolutely no fear once the mission actually got going. Then we flew at extremely low level, reached the target, pulled up, delivered our ordnance. We fortunately, very fortunately for us, the combat air patrol of three Sabre jets and one F-104 had just landed for refueling and we were able to strafe all of them on the ground and we returned with very low fuel state back to Adampur. So during the debrief, we were told that uh, the mission was the most successful for the day because we had destroyed some aircraft and installations at Sargoda and returned. The aspect of fear, I was very scared in the beginning. Once the mission started, there was no fear. Once the debriefing was over and I came back to the crew room and grabbed a cup of tea, my hands started shaking. So that's my experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, because uh, one, of, one, of the, one of the most significant aspects of soldiering uh, is uh, how do you how do you conquer fear uh, and uh, the answer as you rightly said is that the moment your training kicks in 
that's when the fear evaporates. Uh, so my next question is to Admiral Arun Prakash and we fast forward to the 1971 war, sir. Uh, so the most enduring, so uh, everyone knows that in the 1971 war, you were, uh, uh, you were posted to an Indian Air Force squadron, number 20 squadron flying hunters from Pathan Court. Uh, you had a very, uh, uh, a very charismatic and in, uh, inspirational CO, Wing Commander Cecil Parker. Uh, you were fully ops uh, and you flew several combat missions against various targets that I'd already mentioned. But uh, could you, uh, uh, could you tell us a bit about some of the missions you flew and that most enduring story around you is a, about how you shot up uh, Brigadier General Chuck Yeager's executive jet parked at uh, Chaklala? Before I get into this, let me just go back to the Navy a little bit and pick up from where I left off. In the six years between 65 and 71, the Navy went out all out and made some acquisitions from the Soviet Union, which included four submarines, which we didn't have any of. Um, five corvettes, anti-submarine corvettes, and most significantly, eight missile boats, which played a very important role in the 1971 war. So, just as a backgrounder, as far as I was concerned, I was deputed to the Air Force in late 1970 and joined um, this 20 squadron, which was equipped with this long-range hunter. Uh, at the beginning of 71, we knew that something was was brewing and war is likely to break out. My squadron was in close to Delhi. But in, I think in March or April 1971, the Prime Minister summoned the Chief of Army Staff and told him, walk into East, Beng East Pakistan. And the Chief was General Manik Shaw. And this is a good example for all the young people here. The Army Chief, at grave risk to his own career and standing, stood up to the Prime Minister of the day and said, Madam, uh, I, will, I can obey your orders, but I can guarantee you that we will lose this war. Uh, the Prime Minister was very angry and the Defence Minister tapped him gently and said, watch out what you're saying, Sam. This was General Sam Manikshaw. And Manikshaw had the courage of conviction to tell the Prime Minister that if you don't like what I'm saying, I am willing to give my resignation on health grounds and I'll just disappear. Fortunately, the Prime Minister of the day had good, enough sense, good sense to pay heed to what he said, what the general said, and the conflict was then postponed from March to December. Uh, the initiative was, of course, with Pakistan. Why I'm saying is this, that this pause between March and December gave my squadron uh, enough time to prepare uh, for, for what was about to come. And here I was very impressed with the way the, the, the Indian Air Force did things because um, my squadron commander, Wing Commander Parker, who was received a Mahavir Chakra at the end of the war, uh, an outstanding leader uh, set an example by by his personal leadership, which we just followed. And talking about fear, sir, um, we also felt a little bit of fear, but our fear arose more from the fear of the squadron commander that if you don't find your target or if you find your target and don't shoot properly, what is the squadron commander going to do to you? That was the uppermost fear in our mind. And, you know, we used to dread the thought of getting lost or whatever. With many many of us did get lost. Some lost their nerve and came back and so on. Uh, so every Saturday uh, morning, the squadron commander would call, him, call us to his room, lock the room, lock the door. And there was adequate intelligence, photo reconnaissance done by people like Air Marshal Philip Rajkumar, photographs of enemy airfields, uh, fuel dumps, ammunition dumps, railway stations. We knew exactly what, what to expect. We marked our maps and um, memorized the routes and the timings and so on. So on the 3rd of December, we were in Delhi. We had been pulled back for fear of a preemptive attack. We heard the Prime Minister at midnight saying we're at war next morning. We uh, Early morning at 3 o'clock, as he did, went back to our base. And such was the preparation that the squadron commander, who was going off leading the squadron, as he said he would, for the first sortie on the way, when we landed, we met him on the way. He said, Arun, you take Chaklala. So I knew exactly what he meant. The map was ready. I went to my to the confidential safe, took out the map, and we were ready and took a number two, was a flying officer. So we flew to Chaklala, which was an Air, Pakistan Air Force base. And very briefly, I'll relate what, what happened there. Uh, whole of North India was covered by low fog. 
so in our transit from delhi to patan court we didn't we couldn't see a thing uh, and we, when we took off for our target after about an hour the same weather persisted we flew over the pir panjal range northwards first then turned hard left um, uh, westwards headed for chaklala chaklala was again covered by low fog no targets um, we saw a tower which i presumed was a air control so we pulled up and attacked it and as we pulled out of the dive huge gout of water met us greeted us so i realized that i had shot up a water tower so i said the pakis won't get a bath this morning <laughs> but while taking a circuit we saw some aircraft hidden under camouflage under trees we took a shot at it and then we saw a lineup of obviously civilian aircraft but there was no other military target so we said let's go for them so we strafed the whole lot of military targets and one of them happened to belong to brigadier general chuck yeager so it's no great achievement shooting down poor chuck yeager's aircraft on the ground but uh, um, greatness was thrust on me so after that i flew eight nine missions but generally more of the more of the same so you were you were inducted into the combat zone in 1971 directly from staff college as a major and your battalion was involved in that very famous uh, siege of the silet uh, garrison uh, the battalion had gone through a lot in the preceding weeks and you were directly uh, heli landed into the combat zone could you tell this young audience about your gorkha troops during the battle of silet why were they so feared by the pakistanis uh, and what was your experience during the battle of silet i don't know what you kids will take away from here what will you remember what will you remember about this amazing military lit fest and therefore in answer to the question i will just tell you a story about what happened in answer to what a marshal arjun has asked i had mentioned to you earlier that my battalion had attacked adgram with khukris as our only weapon of war we demolished the opposition and after that they didn't have the guts to come back to us in close combat after that the trouble with the army or any army in the world is when you do well you get a more difficult task then we were told to capture gazipur we captured gazipur but in the process by now we had entered the war with 18 officers three had got killed seven had got wounded now we had only 11 officers left and the co a very brave commanding officer lieutenant colonel arun bimrao harolekar was trying to get in organize the battalion reorganize the battalion because of so many casualties but as avm arjun subramanian has said one of the greatest attack strategic commanders of the indian army was sagat singh and sagat was an impatient man sagat wanted to be the first in dhaka and he heard that the brigade pakistani brigade holding silet had gone to the defense of dhaka and he said send in the gurkhas so the co said sir are we the only battalion in this co give me time he said no there is no time go immediately so in war orders are orders we were the first battalion to conduct indian army's first heavy bone operation but there were a lot of questions to be asked were we going to be reinforced the teaching in the army is if you are para dropped or heli landed behind enemy lines you need to be reinforced within 48 hours otherwise the force will disintegrate due to lack lack of food lack of ammunition and heavy casualties we were not reinforced for 9 days and 9 nights we fought for 9 days and 9 nights without food without water with diminished ammunition but the co knew intuitively that we would never be we would never be yeah, yeah. we would never be reinforced and so he told the jsus and the officers look this is what's going to happen we will do away with food we will do away with water we will do away with clothing we will take extra ammunition and grenades and the jsus and officers said yes sir and we went in as i told you we fought for 9 days and 9 nights and finally on the 15th of december two pakistani officers came with white flags wanting to surrender we said go back the co said go back i have no orders to accept your surrender carry on the fight then they said 
no no can we talk to the brigade commander why the brigade commander because the bbc had mistakenly announced a brigade of gorkhas has landed at sylhet so we were listening the pakis were listening and we managed to bluff them that we were a brigade but we suffered heavy casualties and on that last day no listen to this they asked the brigade commander when he when he came by helicopter where are you why who's come in this helicopter so he said i've come in this helicopter he said aren't you here he said no where are you i'm 100 miles away then what is here he said it is one gurkha battalion no is half a gurkha battalion they were absolutely astonished they could not believe and we were surprised and astonished because three brigadiers two full colonels 170 pakistani officers 290 jsus and 8000 troops surrendered to us by that time we were just 352 thank you thank you very much uh, thank you very much for that inspiring story of uh, half a gorkha battalion forcing uh, a brigade plus in the silat garrison to surrender air marshal rajkumar uh, you have a very interesting uh, incident to relate uh, about your interaction with none other than general president musharraf uh, would you quickly uh, tell this very interested audience as to where you met general musharraf Uh, and how did you meet him once again flying over an airfield that you were supposed to attack in 1971 the indian air force sent me to the royal college of defense studies to undergo a year long course which is the equivalent of the course which is done at the national defense college in delhi so two indians go to the uk and two british officers come to delhi so in the rcds there were two pakistani officers a brigadier farwaz musharraf from the pakistan army and air commodore ali uddin from the pakistan air force now in 2005 we had a reunion and farwaz musharraf was then the president of pakistan he was also the chief of the pakistan army so my wife and i flew from bangalore to islamabad and after a two days in islamabad we were taken in a c130 aircraft from chaklala to chitral which is at the foot of the hindu kush mountains now once we got into the c130 aircraft ali uddin who was also there he said uh, philip would you like to come up to the cockpit i said yes sure and i ran up the ladder and sat between the two pakistani pilots and we started rolling down the chaklala runway then it struck me that when i was at the tactics and combat development establishment in 1971 the unit was given the task of carrying out night harassment raids over pakistani airfields and i was given the task of bombing chaklala taking off from amritsar flying low level for 23 minutes and attacking chaklala so in 1965 i went to sargoda without a visa in 1971 i went with a visa and saw the runway which i was supposed to attack in 1971 good afternoon everyone i am shifa iqbal from colonel central academy gurugram my question is for admiral arun prakash sir at time of instrument of accession of jnk it was agreed that once the situation is normalized there the aspirations of people will be ascertained through a plebiscite but even after 75 years no referendum or plebiscite has taken place yet so sir due to what circumstances has it still not been possible and what do you think is its possibility in the future thank you thank you for that question i am not sure why you are directing it to me but i happen to be a kashmiri myself so i'll try and answer your question uh one of the conditions laid down by the united nations when we went to them with the kashmir problem was that the armed forces of both countries will withdraw india can leave some forces behind but pakistan being an invader will withdraw totally now that never happened pakistan never withdrew its forces from what is now pakistan occupied kashmir so india has felt justified in not resorting to plebiscite or referendum etc but instead of that we've had many free and fair hopefully free and fair elections in 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 kashmir and the will of the people has been expressed adequately and that's the reason that we have not uh, held a plebiscite or not thought it necessary to have a plebiscite good evening sir i'm ahan sparsh from wellamboy school 
Sir, my uh, question is directed at the panel as a whole. It is evident to the whole world that Pakistan is a clear motive to gain over Indian territory. In your opinion, sirs, what is Pakistan's ultimate aim? Do they just want Kashmir or is, or is it just a first step in a bigger scheme of events? Uh, there is a fundamental difference between how Pakistan and India look at each other. Uh, Pakistan looks at India as an existential threat and sees the accession of Kashmir into Pakistan as uh, one of its founding father's dreams. India looks at Pakistan as a security threat. And India's stand is that if Pakistan stops assisting hybrid proxy war and a covert war in JNK, uh, India has no aspirations on any Pakistani territory, right? So there is a fundamental difference in the way at which India and Pakistan look at one another. Uh, and, and, and that is the state of affairs. The second reason is that following the 1971 defeat, the Pakistani army is the one that controls the Pakistani state. And the existence of the Pakistani army is fundamental and contingent on continued enmity with India. So these are the these are the particular driving factors behind what dictates India-Pakistan relations today. When we have been successful at wars previously, is there really a need? And if there is a need, then is it correct to subordinate the Indian Air Force as only a support arm, as mentioned by our previous CDS? Okay, uh, I, you know, uh, I don't think that uh, this discussion merits a discussion on theatrization. Needless to say that uh, every modern armed forces looks at integrating capability to be able to deliver effects. So as long as we continue working towards integrating combat capability to cater for contemporary security th threats, that is what we should be looking at. But as far as theaterization is concerned, I don't think that uh, this discussion is, uh, is all about theaterization, right? Good afternoon, sir. My name is Arya Singh, I'm from RIMZ. I want to ask a question that, why Goa was liberated after so many years of Indian independence? The simple reason was, Goa was outside the political consciousness of New Delhi for so many years, right? For example, if Goa had been closer to New Delhi, Delhi would have liberated Goa much earlier. But Goa being so far away from New Delhi, uh, Goa remaining a Portuguese, Portuguese uh, colony for the time that it did, did not trouble New Delhi as much. And it was only when political consciousness in Maharashtra and Goa uh, emerged as a threat to re-election for the Congress government at that particular time, was it contemplated for military action to be conducted against Goa. So in my opinion as a military historian, Goa should have been liberated much, much earlier than 1961. But I think it was political apathy that allowed Goa to remain a Portuguese colony for as long as it did. My word of advice is to you young people, because the oldies are now in the departure lounge. What I'd like to tell you is, please remember four rules. Rule number one, do what you love. Choose your career according to what you love. Rule number two, love what you do. That means be the best in your, your chosen profession. That means not to compete with others. It's okay if you do. Compete with yourself and raise the bar of your own competence till you reach the top. Rule number three, never be afraid. You heard what A. Marshall Philip Rajkumar said and what Sam Manikshaw has said. There's nobody without fear, but we in the army conquer fear and move on. And lastly, never give up. First rule, do what you love. Number two, love what you do. Number three, don't be afraid. Number four, never give up. To all the young people I meet, I always give my rule number one. All of you have hopes, aspirations, dreams. And you have to achieve all that in your life by this body and this brain. So rule number one, if you want to succeed in life, according to me, is physical and mental fitness. Please look after yourselves, eat right, exercise right, 
and always preserve your mind and body. Otherwise, you cannot achieve your dreams. Second point which I want to emphasize is always dream big and chase your dreams. As the poet Robert Browning said, if a man's reach is equal to his grasp, what is a heaven meant for? In a few years from now, you will be adults, you will cast your vote. Uh, remember that we've sent 540 or more members of parliament and our parliament rarely discusses issues relating to national security. The na defense budget is never, never discussed. And then you hear some statements which say that our young people are very young. When the time comes, the problem is that when the comes, when the time comes, it's too late. You need 5, 10, 15 years to develop a capability. So I think when you, when you reach adulthood and you are in positions of power, even if some of you don't join the armed forces, please make sure that our, those who rule our destinies are made conscious of the importance of national security, what the armed forces do for the country and what they need from the country in return. Thank you very much, sir. And thank you very much, delegates, for your contribution. <laughs> सबसे न्यारा गुलिस्ता हमारा है भारत हमको जहाँ से प्यारा है सबसे न्यारा गुलिस्ता हमारा है सदियों से भारत भूमि दुनिया की शान है भारत माँ की रक्षा में जीवन कुर्बान है भारत हमको जहाँ से प्यारा है सबसे न्यारा गुलिस्ता हमारा है हिंदुस्तानी नाम हमारा है सबसे प्यारा देश हमारा है